I'll hit record and I'll officially start the podcast. So we actually record this as a podcast, but we do it as a live stream too. It's kind sure. of fun and it's a cool, it's a, it's a cool format. It's worked really well for us. So um, if we do have some community questions come out, I might field them if they're appropriate. So um, we are live. Hey everybody. We're here with Gordon White from Rune Soup. Super excited about this. Um, let's just get into it. I'm going to hit record. And um, so I'll, I'll do a little uh, intro and a little uh, bio on you, Gordon. I'll throw it to Bear, who will uh, welcome you. And then we'll just go into a discussion. And it's really free-flowing. Just uh, we'll have a fun time. So uh, you, know what, you know how this works, Gordon. You're a pro. Nice one. That's what the microphone says. <laughs> yeah. And, and dude, I'm really loving your podcast. I, I actually discovered you through Higher Side Chats and um, I've, I've been diving deep in, oh, into cool. your podcast. And uh, actually, uh, a number of uh, people in our community are very familiar with your podcast and were nice. chastising me for not knowing about it. So <laughs> we're, we're um, kind of we're newbies in the business. We're not old pros like you are. Yeah, it's <laughs> funny. It's funny how you can kind of get to old pro status in podcasting. Um, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, and and speaking of higher side checks, they just had Adam Curry on, um, uh, and uh, he d and I'm just loving this uh, this podcasting 2.0 platform he's talking about as someone who works in that kind of technology and stuff. So, anyways, there's so much exciting things happening with quote unquote podcasting right now, and um, so um, okay, let's go ahead. I'm gonna hit record and we'll fire it up. And boom, we're welcome back to another episode of AlphaCast. I'm Mike Winter. I'm here as always with Dr. Bear Paul Lando up here on the beautiful Smith River in the wonderful great state of Jefferson, where our mentality is all about freedom and, and self-sufficiency and, and sovereignty and, um, you know, that old school Americana that we love so dearly here. And uh, wow, it's been... <laughs> I got to admit, Bear, it's been quite a week. Uh, reunion Summit, we, you've been hearing us talking about this for, God, what, three months now? It is launched. Um, we've soft launched it yesterday. Affiliates haven't started yet, but you can jump in and be one of the first to see the site, reunionsummit.com. An amazing uh, assortment of speakers on there from Dolores Cahill to Catherine Austin Fitz, Sayer G, Kelly Brogan, Andy Kaufman. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. Chef Pete Evans, uh, Mir One, the fantastic truther artist, Ali Zek, uh, uh, Shunya Murti, who is going to do a spiritual teaching day one, um, Dr. Melissa Sell, Dr. Edith Ubuntu Chan, uh, Carrie Clasby from um, her Malibu permaculture, or excuse me, biodynamic farm. Uh, I mean, I don't want to leave people out. There's so many people. Our friend Justin Franson, of course. Eric Cassano is doing a two-hour holotropic breath workshop. Um, Lena Poo. Um, of course, Marcelina Kravit, uh, who's doing the, the documentary that's featuring Bear Lando about uh, terrain theory called The Terrain, which is featuring Andy Kaufman, Tom Cowan, Kelly Brogan. Um, just finished a, a, a recorded panel with she and Mir One and and my and Owen um, and uh, uh, Chef Pete Evans. Uh, I mean, just the list goes on and on. Cordal will be featured there. A bunch of uh, uh, new and upcoming uh, Crypto 3.0 projects that I'm in, we're involved with. Uh, Eli Burns doing a, um, an amazing live Qigong class. Uh, David Avocado Wolf was just added. Tom Barnett was just added. I mean, it's just, it's just, um, Josh Del Sol, uh, thank you for helping us with this. Um, it's just amazing. So reunionsummit.com, you can uh, register there. It's a free seven day summit with, of course, a lot of these things were shot live in Joshua Tree last uh, October when we did our festival there. And so it's a really special thing we've designed out. So you get your yoga mat out, you do some breath work, you do some meditation, you get into some thought provoking live streams and panels with all of these amazing people that are involved. Um, I just couldn't be more excited. So, um, in fact, today's show is sponsored by Alpha Vedic's own uh, our zero point gold platinum. It's what's gotten me through this week. I don't know if you can see that our zero there we point, go. our zero point um, gold platinum fulvic humic base um, transitional elements. My pineal gland is in fuego, Gordon. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's I really can see it from here, Michael. That's glowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it's going so. Anyways, uh, we have Gordon White on the show today. Couldn't be happier. I, I'm a I'm a big fan of his work with the Rune Soup podcast. And um, yeah, let's get right into it. If you guys are new to AlphaCast, if you're coming over from Gordon's uh, world, uh, you can just find out everything about us at AlphaCast.com. That's A-L-F-A as in Alpha Waves dot com. Um, so let's get into it. Um, give me a second while I bring up. Okay, here we go. Gordon White has lived and traveled all over the world and moved onto a little permaculture farm in southern Tasmania at the beginning of 2018. Australian by birth, Gordon White's family has strong connections to the wider South Pacific, thanks to his grandfather's experience in colonial administration. And forgive me if I butcher this, uh, is that Nauru? Or is that Nauru? Nauru? Yeah, it's Nauru. Nauru. And yeah. New Guinea. Uh, he spent much of his early years exploring and diving in Micronesia, uh, Melanesia, and Polynesia. Gordon first <clears throat> became interested in Western occultism at the age of 13, following a series of intense dream experiences, and this interest became a lifelong pursuit. His esoteric learnings found an inspirational overlap with his exploration of the Pacific following the publication of Graham Hancock's classic Fingerprint of the Gods, one of my favorites. Uh, this led him to study documentary production at a university level, film and an underwater documentary about Nan Madol, and then go on to work for BBC Magazine's Discovery Channel and news media companies in both hemispheres. After moving to London, he held senior data and analytics positions in global media companies, as well as starting a chaos magic blog and podcast called Rune Soup, which ultimately led to the publication of his first three books, The Chaos Protocols, Starships, A Prehistory of the Spirits, and Pieces of Eight. Over the course of this journey, Gordon has had the privilege of speaking to some of the world's leading authorities in Assyriology, Religious Studies, Genetic Research, Hermeticism, Psy Research, the History of Western Magic, and UFOlogy. The overriding mission of his work is an attempt to cohere an evidence-based Western magical worldview that combines history, paranormal research, the best available scientific research, and UFOlogy, can you believe it? Gordon White, you are basically doing everything I love from film <laughs> to woo-woo. I was a film major too and worked in the industry in Hollywood. And man, and look how I, we turned out. Look how we turned out. <laughs> Bear Lando, how are you today? I'm doing great, gentlemen. Uh, Gordon, I don't know where to get started with you here. And Michael, by the way, uh, with all your business, you forgot to mention that we're also preparing for Anarchapoco. Oh. Yes. And uh, and yes. about a thousand other things. We're preparing for uh, spring planting. We've got a few hundred new Jaugulan starts in the works. We've got a hundred new ashwagandha plants that are ready to go in the ground in about a month and a half here. So it's a crazy busy time. And I know, uh, Gordon, you're coming to us live from your permaculture farm as well. So we've got permaculture to work uh, talk about. We've got uh, magic. You know, when I was um, looking over your site and listening to some of your podcasts, uh, you know, that key, it keeps coming up as a recurring theme in your work, which is uh, near and dear to us because uh, our whole spiel here is that magic is just misunderstood science. And, uh, you know, sometimes we'll talk that, about... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, uh, I'd love yeah. to get your input on it. Uh, so, you know, we, we call it more alchemy. And, uh, you know, in alchemy, of course, it was uh, a complete science where they looked at the qualitative and quantitative side of things. And, uh, you know, we were accused of witchcraft at one point when we were talking about it. And, uh, you know, I explained, well, no, actually, witchcraft is just uh, using the qualitative side of things, but they keep it in a cult and they use it, not witchcraft, to say, say black magic. Um, yeah, so we don't lump everybody in a, into a pejorative there. And uh, so anyway, uh, you know, but they keep it uh, occulted with bad intent, whereas complete science is both sides of the equation. On the other hand, we have the other type of dark magic, which is what we now call science, which only brings us into the materialistic quantitative realm. So yeah. what we're trying to do is bring everything, uh, you know, into perspective here and, and help people understand that what maybe we consider magic actually has uh, a real understanding that's been occulted for good reasons for a long time. 
So Gordon, uh, we can talk about that. We can. We already had kind of a little mini podcast uh, before we got on air today. We can talk about farming. Uh, I told you I'd tell you a bunny rabbit story if you want to talk us about your uh, your rabbit enterprise. So <laughs> anyway, my friend, thank you so much for being here. I'll be quiet. I want to listen to you and uh, and uh, tell us what's going on down under. Sure, sure. Well, I mean. I just want to come back to the uh, magic and science thing because there's obviously, the, I like to reverse what Arthur C. Clarke said um, about it because when you think about people kind of, to, to land on a definition of magic is to land on an understanding of what kind of universe you live in, right? And the fundamental question is whether you think you live in a living universe, like is the cosmos alive or is it some sort of dead machine? kind of gradually running out of steam like a 19th century train engine, like the people in the 19th century thought. And this is why I think science is downstream from magic. Um, it does, it, it is a one trick or one spell magical system, which very often kind of like, especially when it's weaponized, does tip you into this sort of materialist reality, right? Because uh, magic is sort of what you do when you are in relation to a living cosmos. Um, and I just staying with witchcraft, then I actually like to restore the pejorative because one of the things that ha Western esotericism got wrong in the last <laughs> 70 years is um, saying, oh, witchcraft is an evil. That's um, you're just being sexist. And I'm like, well, then you're being racist because every other culture around the world um, has a definition of witchcraft and what a witch is. And it is a being a, a human in some cases, but not all that does work malefic magic. So that we, when we lose that distinction, we lose the ability to navigate. Now that doesn't mean that the people who identify as neo-pagan or Wiccan are evil. Um, it means they need to realize that they are using a term in a minority sense, where if you go to the, witch, uh, the witch's market, which I've done in somewhere like Lima or La Paz, um, you don't find um, so mode it be bath mats. You um, you find skulls and poisons and, and things that are used for Malefica. So I actually like to restore witchcraft back to it. I like to give it back its teeth um, because it, on a global basis, that's, you know, when my family grew up or my dad and my aunt and so on in New Guinea, if you ask them what a witch is there, it's the person they're like kicking out of the village because they've been throwing curses at people, right? Sounds like you're describing the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's like if you, when you realize you are existing in a living cosmos, the, um, you have a, I think, a, a, a more tactical frame for things like Big Pharma and, and the various moves that are going on because you can kind of see the entities behind it, but you can also put them in comparison to stuff that you are aware of, right? Which is this sort of, um, Big Pharma is a perfect example. I mean, there is an entity behind it, but even if there wasn't, it almost has, it, it's not intelligent enough to live in a, in, a, in a living universe, right? So it sort of only has three commands that run the whole thing. The, the, the profit motive and the belief in um, that sort of Rocket, Rockefeller materiality. And even if there wasn't a being behind it, if you just let that script run, you end up with the global pharma system we have anyway. So just to get the distinction right, we have uh, a living universe, which I believe is what magic is all about. And, you know, magic is just uh, a matter of semantics to me. Sure. And then you have the, the, the people that use it with bad intent. So um, they're obviously understanding, you know, the workings of the universe in ways that the general population doesn't have and acknowledging that it is playing yeah. with living forces. It's just a matter of intention. And I would say what uh, we consider science these days is more that other level that you describe, which is because everything is, you know, into a reductionist quantifiable side of the equation only it's just looking at dead entropic systems that um, we are taught, of course, we're also doomed to the same fate. So yeah. um, am I getting all that right? No, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And, and one of the challenges 
uh, and and it's an exciting challenge that we are looking at in this century is, and I sort of describe it this way, and I use things like parapsychology and, and psi results like telepathy and remote viewing to do it, is that we have used empiricism to get to the very edge of the things that can be determined empirically. Empiricism is, has got itself to the point where we can empirically demonstrate that it is um, it cannot be used as the single mode to understand reality. And, and so it's science, we have been told that science is the same thing as a sort of materialist empiricist approach. And it's not, it's not even where it began. It, it began with natural philosophy, right? And so we're, we're sort of at a point where um, we get to, and it's exciting, we get to make that next step. And it's one of the reasons I like to restore teeth to witchcraft, because it's not just the Malefica. That same woman is the person you would go to for birth control and abortions and so on. So there's a, what's interesting about witchcraft is there is a health sovereignty in the face of a political system that is persecuting you story there, which is very now, right? So, um, coming into, I would say, a healthy understanding, which isn't an entirely um, beneficial one, or it doesn't mean you're 100% pro these things, but they exist, right? Um, and and there's there's medicine in, this, in the stories themselves. So the witch is someone who um, has an inherited understanding of health sovereignty in a way oppositionally to the state. So a good friend of mine and my publisher, um, Peter Gray, in Apocalyptic Witchcraft says, you will find the witch at the end of the pointed finger. That is essentially his definition of witchcraft. And that applies around the world. That's why I keep saying to people who think um, witchcraft is some sort of misunderstood feminism. That's a real white middle-class American female approach, right? They've gone to college and decided that the witch trials were um, misogyny, which it was very, it was clearly in play, but again, you're dealing with a minority of the world, the planet's population's experience of what we define as witchcraft. So you kind of need to widen it out without invalidating that. And finding the witch at the end of the pointed finger is a really good definition for what witchcraft looks like now, given how fraught things like health, health sovereignty have been in the last, I don't know, 11 and a half months. Yeah. Would you say that, um, shamanism is kind of a counter point to witchcraft. Um, and of course, traditionally that's thought as more of a male type role, but obviously we know there's such things, female shamans, of course, would that be the counter to the- idea Not necessarily because, um, so there's two things there. So um, we use shamanism since Michael Hanna in the seventies and Mircea Eliade in the sixties used it as a categorization for um, an indigenous belief system that runs on, on spirit interactions. It is, so there's two things going on there. The first is that shamanism is an actual um, cosmovision sort of in the Siberia, Mongolia area and has been for about 10,000 years. Um, but if we mean it in the sense of uh, you will find a role like that. So for instance, I'm currently training in a shamanic energy, I'm getting certified in a shamanic energy medicine system that has a Quero lineage um, from the Andes and they, they'll use the word shaman. Like there are, there are words in, in Quechua, but they're happy when they're speaking Spanish or English, shaman's fine, right? So if you mean it in that broad sense, no, uh, and, and yes and no, because one of the things you learn when you do say uh, an energy healing system is that if you can, if you identify in someone's field where there is a, an imprint or, or a health thing that's, that needs um, removing, you can also press on it. And you find the same thing in, in Vedic astrology where you can look at someone's chart and look at where, um, well, like Vedic anything, because the astrology is nested in, in, in the cosmology that comes with Ayurveda and health and so on, right? You can press as well as heal. So it's not necessarily a counter. It runs on the same kind of like fact or reality that the universe is alive and we're in a kind of intentional relation with all these different beings. But it's, it's definitely not good guys versus bad guys. And like I've been in the Amazon with ayahuasca and, and uh, those, are, those are closer to the good guys, right? Because they're there, um, they work for her and they do healing. But what happens when you're in ceremony is that you there's a lot of free energy that's coming out of you that sorcerers will actually try and get. So a big part of the 
uh, Ayahuasca's role is to protect the ceremony space from sorcerous attack. So again, we have if, if we move outside of the West, we have a, a much more nuanced understanding of kind of like, quote unquote, how magic works, that is really, really useful to hold up in comparison and kind of bring back into our own experience. It doesn't mean we go and become ayahuasqueros or, or the opposite, like being sorcerers that steal energy from um, medicine circles. But for that to work has implications for how we operate our own kind of like holistic and energetic health. So, um... What you're describing as far as what shamanism is about is uh, suspiciously close to what some of us are doing in the fields of biogeometry and radiesthesia these days, where we actually can measure those forces that you're uh, yeah. referencing and also, uh, you know, do go one of two ways with them. We can manipulate them for somebody's benefit or, you know, you could have the option of pushing on things. And it's been a dilemma, of course, for centuries, because uh, like biogeometry, for instance, um, was uh, first pattern. It's, it's like an upgrade of technology from, uh, you know, what they're actually doing in Egypt. And there was two schools in Egypt that, uh, you know, were doing very high work that allowed that civilization to last as long as it did and also very spiritual base. But then along came some folks that started using the same understanding, uh, you know, for more sinister motives. And, you know, so we're told that was the downfall of that civilization. The same um, kind of uh, uh, quandary, you know, happened with the uh, theosophical and the anthroposophical societies at the turn of the century, whereas the theosophists said, no, we've got to keep this to ourselves because, some people inevitably are going to misuse this and, and the world isn't ready for it, where Steiner and the anthroposophical folks said, uh, no, we've got to get the truth out. So, um, and then, uh, of course, a lot of Wiccans would say, well, no, we're doing exactly what shamans do. We aren't evil at all. So it, it's definitely uh, an interesting subject matter. And it's interesting also that in this day and age, a lot of people are uh, going back to some of those shamanistic roots. And some of us are actually bringing it into the technological age and so that we have an understanding of what those forces are in the first place. Sure. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I guess that's more of a statement, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. anything you have to say about that? <laughs> Just, uh, it's not that it's measuring. Um, the way you phrase that, I would, I would re-describe, which is um, becoming aware that things like fields and spirits exists invites measurement, but it's not the same as measuring it. Um, you can derive measurements from that reality, but to say it's measuring it is, is kind of like dangerously descriptive. And it gets back to that whole, oh, science is just a better description of magic or magic is a poor description of science. And that is, that is not correct, right? So that's kind of what, that, I, I agree completely. I'm very interested, particularly when it comes to plant stuff, because we're talking permaculture and, and, and so on. I'm very interested in biophotons and, and, and the things we can observe that have about plant interactions, but it will never be the full story, right? Because there's stuff that happens in forests and so on that we can kind of go, maybe mycelial network, maybe it's this. Um, but if you consider, so animism is the extension of personhood beyond the human. So if you consider the tree a being, and we don't use English, and even in permaculture, it's my tremendous frustration with it. We use the language of a machine universe, even if we nod along and say, no, I think, I think the universe is alive. And it's particularly with English, we get stuck using machine language. So, um, and a good example would be Bill Mollison famously said, everything gardens. If he'd, he should have said, for, from an animist perspective, everyone gardens because trees are people and chickens are people and, and so on. But if he said everything, everyone gardens rather than everything gardens, people would assume he was talking just about humans. So he had to say everything gardens, but a chicken isn't a thing in animism, right? It, it's a person. So um, I am very interested in the empirical measurements that can shed light on a living universe. But if you can't fall back into having it be the description of it or else you're back in the machine universe. So that's the kind of step that you get with something like animism or perspectivism where um, the story necessarily is permanently incomplete, right? So uh, perspectivism is an Amazon, is an academic description of kind of like Amazonian cosmologies about 
how humans are in a perspectivist relation with other beings uh, around them. And, the, and it's consequently um, open-ended and, and provisional as an epistemology. So if you look, if you look at a jaguar, you make eye contact with a jaguar in the jungle, it sees you as a human. If you don't make eye contact with you, it sees you as lunch, right? And so there's a sort of, there's a right relation about a, and, and a fundamental open-ended um, flow to, to a universe that can, that can contain empiricism, but empiricism can't be the baseline to describe the universe or you're still in a, it's philosophical, but it's important. Um, you, you can't use empirical or scientific descriptions as the definition or description of reality. It is one voice in a choir, right? And I, what I find useful about Amazonian cosmovisions is they know how to do that. They've always known how to do that. They've always known how to live in a world where there are different valid descriptions of things. And, and that's a step that we need to take in, 20, in the 21st century is to how do you live in a world where there are different valid descriptions of things. And, and for me, that is found in the last 40 years or so of anthropology because they had to get there first. If you consider what anthropology is and when and how it began, it began in the 19th century as a, uh, a white description of how brown people were inferior. Um, and, and so it literally has skeletons in its closet, like, because then began the grand imperial project of literally digging up indigenous people or murdering them and boiling the flesh off their skulls and putting them in, in cupboards in London and Amsterdam and Chicago and so on. So they had to go through the whole, we haven't done this right. If we're supposed to be the study of man, this is not the way, <laughs> this is not the way to do it. So they had, they had like a, everyone has turnings, right? So there was an anthropological turning, which was trying to find how do you study humans when different groups have different understandings of study and, and, and doing it and so on. And, and at that language, I think I'm very excited for anthropology beyond the human because it has taken 40 years to work out how do you maintain the validity of empiricism, but make it right-sized. So don't make it do something it was never intended to do, which was to be the full description of reality, right? It, it, uh, it was never meant to be that. It, it's, it's a very useful voice in a choir describing a living universe, I guess. Yeah, it's one tool in a massive toolbox, correct, if you will. Correct. And yeah. the, it, it makes sense that the Amazonian perspective would be more fractal in nature. One, their language works that way. And two, that we know with ayahuasca, I haven't done it, but I know from those who have experienced it, that is one of the like big takeaways, right? Is the fractal nature of the experience. Totally. And everything is totally. just splitting off so, into infinite I, fractals. Yes. Right? And, and I think because the universe is alive, fractals are an excellent word, because if you'd used holographic, which is this quote unquote, the same, like we're, we're kind of talking about the same-ish thing. But if we use machine language, if we use things that emerge out of a, of, of a language that comes from a, a universe of a machine, it's a trick again. Fractal is fine, but yes, absolutely. I think um, microcosm, macrocosm is a fractal description. I don't think it's an up-down necessarily. First of all, because there is no up-down. Um, when you're looking at the stars, you're looking out. <laughs> you're not looking up, right? So I actually think there's a, um, and my experience with ayahuasca is absolutely that it's fractal. And, and particularly when you're, in a, when you're in the Amazon, when, when I was there, one of the things that, if you haven't been, let's say you live in New York before it got destroyed um, by the Great Reset. Um, and you think, God, I need to get away from it all. It's so crowded here. And you think, oh, the jungle is, is, is as away from the subway as possible. It's the opposite. You are so crowded in <laughs> that you long for a subway. You long for the peace and quiet of a New York subway. You long for the six because um, when you realize that you are surrounded by beings, and I mean surrounded, right? It's the Amazon. Where else are you going to find that kind of biodiversity? Uh, it's, it's a really, really interesting you, you have to have a way of being in the world that deals with its crowdedness, right? And, and that's what, if you live in the Amazon and have for millennia, you're going to be pretty good at navigating a world where you aren't the main character and, that you, and, 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 and being in that relation, right? So there's, there's a tremendous amount of wisdom and, and urgent medicine for our times in um, listening to 
how, and this is a, this is crucial. So it's the difference between products of thought and ways of thinking. Um, there's a guy, um, Aboriginal elder and academic called Tyson Yonkaporta wrote an amazing book called Sand Talk, which I've been discussing for over a year. And it's really exciting to see people in my kind of like wider field reading and understanding it. But he says, and this is key, right? Coming back to epistemologies, he says, um, in the West, the West is interested in indigenous products of thought, not ways of thinking. So he used the example of there being an, an economics conference in Sydney here in Australia. And a, during the lunch, they would bring in an Aboriginal group and they'd be doing Aboriginal music and clapsticks and so on. And then they'd toddle off and they'd go back to talking economics. They didn't ask any of the elders, like what, what does Aboriginal economics looks like? How do you understand things like value and, and what have you? They're not interested in the ways of thinking. They're interested in the products of thought. So people will go to the jungle and ask like, well, what is your deity? Um, what are your spirits? And that's products of thought. It's not ways of thinking. We don't ask them like, how do you live in a crowded universe? Like, how do you validate truth? How do, how do you allow for personhood and agency outside the human? And how have you done it over millennia, right? And I'm, I'm most um, aware of and inspired by Aboriginal cosmovisions because they are the oldest continually practice, practicing cultures on earth, like 50 to 60,000 years at least, right? So they've seen off ice ages. Um, we should listen to their ways of thinking and as well as their products of thought, but I guarantee you they have stuff that we need to know for this moment. And I'm very excited about the 21st century and, and, and the things that can happen in different academic disciplines that allow for that encounter between knowledge systems rather than knowledge transfer to happen in a way that is hopefully less um, broken by an imperial power structure. So we not, not the kind of classic 20th century um, white person goes out to live for two years amongst the natives somewhere, right? But a more eye to eye uh, knowledge share. How do you, um, what is your way of thinking? How, how do you understand the universe and, and how we do it? Because if you try to port it in to an unexamined Western belief, you break it right? You actually break it by, because we use our theory of mind to describe things that come from a different theory of mind. And our theory of mind is trash. So, and anthropology has done a lot of exciting work in the last four decades there. And, uh, and so I kind of do this thing where I look again at quote unquote, Western life from an animist and even a perspectivist frame. And it's looking at the same relations rather than facts. So I don't, a fact is a a fact doesn't exist in animism because the universe is in flow, right? Um, and that's that's kind of key. So do you, it's sort of like, do you think the universe is alive or do you think it's dead? Is the same question is, do you think, when did nature stop, right? Do you think nature is finished? And so we, meet, we've, we find these fixed and discrete facts. Or do you think a living universe is um, in flow? So formed versus already formed, uh, formed versus always forming. And, and outside of the Western frame, particularly in the last three centuries, what Whitehead called our last three provincial centuries, and I think that was perfect, um, everywhere else in the world has, has methods of truth validation that are a better match for a living and forming universe. Um, and, and that it's a real challenge for us. It's a real challenge because we have this language game called English um, that isn't great for this. It's actually really good for some things. And um, so I'm not necessarily in the camp of like, English is shit, we should all learn something else. It's good for some things, but it's um, not for everything, <laughs> no. I guess. So, so how does the average Western mind bridge that gap and uh, go into that level of understanding? I, I would say experientially, right? So I have this mm -hmm. idea that it's more of a take. And I don't necessarily believe it, but I think it's a good way of describing it. Because we've refused to let something like animism be valid in the 20th century, we went sort of round the houses re-describing it. And I, and I did a, so at RuneSoup, we have a membership area. And last year we did a custodianship course. And if you look at the 20th century, we've kind of had to build animism without using the word. And so you look at Christopher Alexander's design techniques, you look at Alan Savory's um, pasture management, you look at things like permaculture, all this stuff, we've 
because it's almost like a recovery species, right? Like, because we won't let it, we won't say like, actually, I think the universe is alive. And I think beings other than humans have agency. We have to kind of have this frankly Baroque at this point, um, over description. Whereas if we just sort of collapse it down to, I think the universe is alive and I think thoughts are people. I don't think thoughts are trapped inside the head. So how, how the human gets there, how the, a Western human gets there initially is experientially. Obviously I'm gonna suggest psychedelics done in the correct way. Um, in, in the chaos protocols, I have a chapter called Becoming Inv Invincible. And that's when you have a, and I don't even like this term, but we have to use it, trouble with English, right? have a parapsychological or psi encounter of such magnitude that you can never get the toothpaste back in the tube, right? So you need to have an encounter. Like I, I asked people on the show, are you a weird kid hoping that someone other than me probably has had like alien encounters as a kid? And I have had people who've been experiences on the show, but if you have lived in an extremely haunted house, um, if you've done the kind of, and I kind of low key recommend this, if you're a teenager and you kind of like break into an abandoned mental hospital with an Ouija board, a few hours later, when you run screaming from that building, you will never be the same again. You might have a little breakdown to deal with. So it's not the best way of doing it, but the important thing to do is to have that, um, I know what I saw moment, which no amount of living in the West can kind of dissolve. Uh, and, and psychedelics have historically been uh, correctly used um, in, in an appropriate ceremonial context, have historically been the way of doing that, right? So once you, if you, you go to the jungle and you do a full dieta like I did, um, you come back the right kind of changed. So you come back and you, you hear people talking about theory of mind. Well, they, they won't say that. First of all, they'll, they'll, they'll say brain instead of mind, which is wrong to begin with. But then they'll talk about thoughts being in their heads or it was just a dream. All this kind of language that is um, no one else anywhere in the world, any when, including our own ancestors up until three centuries ago, would say that. If your deceased grandfather comes to you in a dream, and we're like, oh, it's just a dream. Oh, I guess I ate some weird pepperoni. It's like, what the, the, hell is wrong? <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you, right? So how Westerners get there is to have an encounter, an experiential encounter that demonstrates the profound shortcomings of the theory of mind we've been given. And, and it's, it, you, you live in a different world from that day on. Uh, you need that kind of mass, so uh, that that awakening moment where, uh, yeah, I think so. you know, uh, and and you know, we don't have that rite of passage like a lot of these indigenous. No, exactly. Have, well, that, it, where, that's almost a separate you know. issue because I think I think humans are designed for ceremony. I mean that from an animus perspective. I think a thing we are supposed to do in this cosmos is ceremony. So, um, Dr. Jeremy Nadler, who writes some amazing books about Egypt, mm -hmm. uh, when he when he talks about the Egyptian use of ceremony. So when the Pharaoh would get up before sunrise and go up into this little platform and there's a ceremony, the king can do, which is the sort of, because he's the son of Ra and he's also the Ra and there's this kind of thing where only he can do it, right? It, it is his sunrise ceremony. Now, ceremonies for sunrise happen at different temples up and down the Nile, of course, but this one that Jeremy's describing is for the king. And he describes ceremony as man's share of these events. So, where, and we were talking earlier about you guys are heading into spring. We, it, this is my first spring that we're, we're coming out of summer here, but this is my first spring of planting in earnest, hundreds and hundreds of plants. We had some raised beds the year before and so on, but there were fires and I traveled and it was this whole drama. This year we went ham on it. We put in a heritage cider orchard and so on. And as spring, happens like energetically and we're growing things that is a human share of the of spring happening to the cosmos and, and and ceremony is that which is why you will not find an indigenous culture that doesn't think it is fundamental to the operation of the universe and if you don't do it you fall out of right relation and get sick so one of the things that is so um sick making or or um 
uh, dis-easing in Western civilization is that we don't take ceremony seriously in rites of passage, especially. But um, yeah, outside of that, like it's, that's almost tangential, although it is contained within. So you need some kind of extreme experience. It doesn't even need to be extreme. It could be profound. You could have some sort of beatific encounter with the Virgin Mary in a church somewhere, right? Like it doesn't necessarily, I just, um, I think it is so important that I do include things like whatever a UFO abduction even is, and that's a whole you know, separate show. If you've had that happen to you, um, no amount of people going like, oh, well, you must have had a nightmare or something is going to, you don't know what it is, uh, but you've had an encounter that means that you will never correctly describe the universe. And not just that, it's way more crowded than we, uh, than we necessarily think, right? So that, I think that's, that's, that's fundamental. You need an encounter that will permanently eject you from the Western theory of mind because, and, and kind of drop you back into what I think is a, a better way of being, which is a living crowded universe. Yeah, we've taken the scientific kind of uh, cynicism or, you know, question everything to the extreme where it's a denialism, where it denies these, yeah. you know, and I don't know if you have kids, Gordon, um, but I have, uh, you know, young sons that are still very much in their theta waves and very much grounded in the imagination and can still like in the deep, dark night of their room manifest things that scares nice. them when they come running out and i i embrace this i do all sorts of work with them and for in, in with their dream journals and and going in their dreams and trying to meet each other in their dreams we had tom campbell on the podcast who um has has been really brilliant in kind of connecting uh, the out-of-body experience and remote viewing and all that to a more empiricist western mind i don't agree with a lot of what he says but i also really appreciate where he's going with a lot of what he does so i guess one of the question i'm asking though is Yes, a big revelatory experience, an out-of-body experience, uh, uh, something where you see an entity that can be life-changing. But also there's those, as a child, um, there's those little um, continual experiences that if they're embraced through proper parenting, through proper education, yeah. um, um, that can lead to a much more holistic mentality and stuff because the those little experiences add up right? The little weird dreams, like my son swears that he was uh, recently came in the middle of the night, came screaming into our room that there was a being in his room and he woke up from a dream and he could feel a presence and he was too scared to turn around. And then a huge flash in his room went on and off, on and off. And he's like, dad, I was awake. I know I was awake. I was pinching myself and I couldn't turn around because I knew there was a being in the room and it scared me. And, and I mean, I, you could see it in his face. You can see that he had an experience and to him, that is so darn real. And I, and I, and I, you know, supported him on that. I said, that could very well be. And who yeah. knows, maybe it was what we call Papa, my wife's father who passed away years ago, who was close to my son. I said, maybe he was coming to visit you. The unknown is scary, but doesn't mean it's coming to get you. It could be someone who's coming to try to say hi. But my point is embracing this more because in our current Western mentality, because of the scientism, because of the reductionism, we tend to go, oh, no, that that's just uh, that's a figment of your imagination, a figment See? of it. And, and we and imagine like this is just we have equated uh, imagination with fake. Um, and, and it's not just science. So there's that kind of because I'll come back to that. Um, I had I had to come back around to my childhood experiences, particularly hag attacks and, and sleep paralysis and so on with the benefit of learning magic in adulthood to go, oh, that's what was going on. So it also could have been that, but yeah, I agree. Um, letting kids do that and, and validating their experience, you will grow up a different human than um, th the trauma. They won't necessarily be there in, in kind of having to adjust back to, to a living universe, right? But there's that um, Hemingway line, how did you go bankrupt slowly at first, then all at once? <laughs> and, um, and that describes the failed project of Western epistemology, as far as I'm concerned. Um, because if you look at, we made a couple of historic mistakes. We did with the Greeks as well. So the, the sort of dualism. So we, we separated mind entirely um, and made it better and above um, well, the imaginal when we're talking about the Neoplatonics and, and mm -hmm. kind of decided that physical matter was the lowest, densest and worst of things. And we were supposed to get ever more elevated up to some sort of 
RKO radio tower beaming source, which is dumb, right? That's one dumb thing we did. The other thing is that kind of birthed and came along with a, uh, a religious belief where there is one true document and then the other ones aren't, right? Doesn't necessarily mean they're fake, but there we have certain words that are true. Um, and, and it's in this book and this book is a true thing. And then the other stuff isn't. Cause I, I always say like you, there's no such thing as fiction in the Amazon. Um, fiction only exists in a culture that is, has a book that is true and other books, right? There's storytelling, there's storytelling around a fire. There are stories in the world. The, the cosmos is a story actually. But um, so we, it's that, how did you go bankrupt at first? We, we did a, um, we did terrible things to our understanding of the imaginal, which is kind of unfair because the Greeks at an early level were incredible at it, right? So if you get to the level of Parmenides, so like way back in Greece, um, they have an understanding and, a, and an experience of the imaginal that could go eye to eye with Amazonia or Aboriginal Australia or whatever and be like colleagues, right? So, and then this kind of weird and toxic mix of, um, kind of dumb ideas hits Descartes famously, and 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 the rest is unfortunately history. But when I blame science, which I like, um, I would like to rescue science. Put it that way, it's it's actually downstream from a lot of stuff. So the slowly at first is basically Neoplatonism up to Descartes, and then all at once is Descartes hitting the European empires. Uh, and and so it's it's really interesting when you look at theories of mind elsewhere, and you like in your imagination. Um, if you say, oh yeah, I, um, I guess I was imagining that conversation with my grandfather. You are, what's the fucking imagination, right? And this is why I like Jung. It's sort of, we think imagination is the same thing as fake. Um, it's, it's the real. So um, Jung says the psyche isn't in us, we're in it. So that's the difference. And, and this is kind of coming back to the 20th century had to do everything, had to build an ersatz animism because it wouldn't let that be true. But if you had Christopher Alexander and permaculture and Alan Savory and um, phenomenology, half of it and Jung and so on, we, we actually do have frameworks with it that, that kind of map to our broken theory of mind that allow us to get out of it right mm -hmm. and and you you can find it, it, it and then it's kind of a question of taste especially once you've had that first encounter which is like okay the universe is not how dr fauci describes to take a, a you know a certain example so what do i do with that and you can come at it from a jungian perspective you can come at it one of the other things bill mollison said was um you know i can teach someone to be a gardener and then they garden for a couple of years and you've got a philosopher um, you don't spend time with the more than human world. You don't spend any decent length of time with the more than human world and still be a materialist. It doesn't track, <laughs> right? So yeah. that's that. If we need to build almost like an archetypal shape of of a of an initiatory journey, it's an extreme event that leads you to a framework of understanding that's, that's a good match for you and where you are, that allows you to kind of get outside of the trap of this machine thinking. And it can be scientific. I mean, I'm quite good friends with a number of very good parapsychologists and, and other people who are you know, working in things like experimental physics. I have a cousin who, who's an astronomer at Oxford University and she, um, She's a believer in, in she has her own, what typically happens when you find crazy scientists, like, and I mean that in the, the most loving sense of neurodiverse, like my cousin has a mind that is suited to astronomy um, and her vision of God, like she's a church goer and her vision of God is very different to what's in the Bible, right? But it, it comes from realizing things about reality, which, which science can do if you let it, right? Oh, yeah, I love Jeffrey I Mishlove. Would, um... I was just going to say I love Jeffrey Mishlove and his show. Uh, I don't know if you ever watch it. Oh, sure. it loud because he brings in a lot of the, those, you know, really what, as you're saying, philosophy and science are really one and the same when you get down to it, if it's done the right way. Yeah. Uh, and especially with what we're seeing with quantum, quantum and all that. So, um, but you're right. Psy research, I talk about a lot on this show, I think is extremely powerful because it allows for the two, those two to meet because we're seeing the, um, 
uh, the imagination at play, the mysticism at play, but also quantifiable in many respects with what they've done since the 60s, 70s with that, with Psy Research. And of course, bringing it to the, the more modern times with like the Dean Radins and those kind of guys who are going now really into deeper consciousness studies and showing quantifying them with random number generators and all this stuff and how mm -hmm. they're being affected with the global consciousness projects and stuff. We are, I just wanted to say, I feel like I'm excited and it's going to this Aquarian age of air connectiveness because I believe science is going to get back to how it was. And we're going to go into what some call spirit science or the more yep. true metaphysical science where we can start to um, take the empiricism to the next level by having better ways to measure things. Um, Dr. Tom so Cowan. How do you mean by better? Like, how do you mean better? Right. Because innovative, um, uh, like new measuring tools, like Dr. Tom Cowan had a guy on actually Dr. Tom Cowan's YouTube just got totally deleted. I just found out. Uh, like, oh, really? I was watching him this morning. Like, half an hour ago okay oh, that's it was surprising. on that no, i'm not surprised they're, they're talking about it on the chat right now is it YouTube. allison was it the allison mcdowell episode yeah you okay. if you have allison mcdowell on you're done uh, uh that's I'm amazed. Like, we did our <laughs> chat privately <laughs> uh, we're gonna have her on sayer g had her on and actually he's his channel's still up but yeah she's talking about some serious truth there but he had an amazing guest on who was talking about bio photons and new ways to see how light interacts with water that's quantifiable but showing that like really water is conscious and it's and and how light is everything and how they're, how they're being able to measure in all yeah. new ways so, that, but so this is really important right so empiricism is the premise because we're talking about it as if it's measurement it's not it, empiricism is the premise that um the only things that we can say are true are verifiable via sense data. The only things that are true are available to sense data, which itself is a statement outside of available sense data because you were talking about <laughs> the whole cosmos, right? So it's no, a paradox is, there. <laughs> yeah. So when I say that empiricism has got itself to a point where it can empirically demonstrate that it cannot fully describe reality, that's it. By, so it's not better measurement. Better measurement just still keeps you in that bubble. And we're already at the edge of the bubble. And it doesn't mean we, we shouldn't have more, uh, we shouldn't measure different things. But each time we do that, we need to realize that um, things like biophotons show that there is an awareness inside plant systems or water, um, which break, like, so it's, we can use sense data to demonstrate that there are things in the universe outside of sense data, right? As we understand it, because I was actually on a philosophical show about this a couple of weeks ago, I forget what it was, where um, it was a philosopher of science saying, sure, and or we can develop an empiricism that validates inner experience. And, it, and that is fine. I think that will break empiricism as a description because then you're basically in a native, um, you are in a native epistemology, whether it's Mohawk or Maori or what have you. I've, I've had a guest on the show, Carol Sanford, and her uh, Mohawk grandfather kind of raised her, so taught her um, Mohawk thinking. And it was a inside, outside, all around is what he called it to her, which was when you are in an encounter, when you're taking care of the pigs, when you're in this encounter, that the outside is you doing the pigs and the inside is your um, interior experience, which is why I hate the word imagination, right? Because I like imaginal if I'm going to use it, but it's, a, it's an embodied interiority. It includes what we understand as mind, but like outside, inside, all around. Uh, and, and that is a, a Mohawk epistemology. It is a way of validating true things that, that matches the inner and the outer and considers them equally valid. Now, if we can get an empiricism that can do that, so if we can include imaginal experience as one of our sense datum, you, I think that's amazing. And I do think, I think people are doing that, your good selves included um, now anyway, even if it's not being described as such. But I kind of, I, I want, sometimes like you remember the first ghostbusters movie where the epa guy shows up and gets them to shut down the containment facility and all the ghosts get mm -hmm. um, let out into new york i want to be that guy um i want to haunt the whole world uh because this is coming back to that giving everyone the becoming invincible experience so when we get to how do we make empiricism fit for purpose in the 21st century and one of them is to have the inner as, as a sense datum in, in the sense data that we use to validate truth. 
why not just go full spirit? <laughs> why, not, why not just go mohawk on it? Why not have inside outside all around be your epistemology rather than and it, rather than an empiricism that's kind of trying to port in a better understanding of the imagination, which we're not very good at, and, and so on. So I'm I'm more in the like let's just open up the containment facility and haunt the world, and 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 deal with the um deal with the issues because I I mean I agree completely I think that's that's the key and and if we just talk about we're getting better and better measurements you're still it's spinning wheels yeah it's spinning wheels like you're just getting well, further well, stuck in yeah. it yeah yeah I, I think a lot of it's semantics too you know when we're talking about measuring we're not talking about always quantitative measurement and it's a big difference when you're talking yeah. about qualitative measurement Absolutely. And when you do that kind of measuring, like I was suggesting in fields of radiation and things I've been involved with for a long time, you're using instruments, but you realize you're the real instrument that has to attune with whatever external mechanism you're using. And what it's doing is it allows you to tune into things like Rudolf Steiner described as far as your real sensory apparatus, not the five senses. And it allows you to have an experience. And you realize just like, you know, you're very correctly describing, there's nothing cast in stone. Uh, you know, I, and a, a lot of, uh, you know, and it is a flowing process. And also it's a matter of, um, you know, I think a lot of people that are trying to bridge the gap, uh, the gap are still trying to separate the parts. Like you mentioned spiritual. Yes. Well, I would say, well, what is in spiritual? Exactly. Exactly. I, I mean, uh, you know, yeah. photon, uh, quantum, they all connote particles that we're trying to, you know, introspect it, uh, uh, you know, or inspect it closer and closer magnifications and, and they really don't exist. And, you know, yeah. a lot of uh, times on this show, I, I put out the, the question, uh, you know, for people in imagination, I understand that has its connotations too, but imagine any cityscape or any area of civilization uh, where there is never an imagination, a subjective, uh, you know, reality that's individual and, you know, not a, a consensus, but somebody had a subjective uh, imagining and, and, you know, voila, then we have a manifestation. So, uh, you know, it's really the only real thing there is. And of course, what, Agreed. what I always say, and whether it's medicine or agriculture, because we apply these, uh, concepts and practices and experience them through medicine and agriculture, uh, you know, what it's really about is not so much healing the body. It's not so much, you know, growing a 50 pound turnip, uh, what it's about is allowing that endeavor to give you an experience to bring you, you know, kind of bridge that gap into what the, the shamans and people indigenous cultures already know. And I also think there's some value for people in those cultures to understand a little bit of the machinations of the Western mind. And, you know, and I think what we're experiencing on the planet right now is an integration and a coming together of the two hemispheres. So there's no longer a separation. And as far as um, certain triggering events, I think we have a, a pretty major triggering event on the way that's gonna give uh, folks that opportunity to get out of their minds uh, entirely. Oh, absolutely. It, it it's just perfect for it, right? So Alberto Violdo said something which I really like about it, which is um, what's going on at the moment. Because I, I use Charles Fort's dominant system to kind of describe the eons of the world, but I'll get back to that. Um, Dr. Violdo said, imagine the cosmos or Pachamama or God or whatever you want has tipped the whole planet and all of mankind right now into an experiment. And the experiment is to work out new what what how what are the ways we're going to be living now what are the new and exciting ways that we're going to be living for the next couple of hundred years and if you're not part of that experiment you're part of the control group and you don't want to be in the control group for this experiment and and i think that's a marvelous way of kind of talking about the arrival of what i would call the dominant or what charles fort called the dominant of wider inclusion so we're or the dominant of witchcraft like we are reaching and how he's worked, how his dominant system works. And he got there before um, Thomas Kuhn, who was kind of Cold War propaganda anyway. Um, but Charles Fort, looking back through time, he spent 
years in the New York Public Library and the British Museum and, and other places looking at newspaper reports from around the world of fish falling from the sky during rainstorms and all the kind of strange and anomalous, the damned facts, he called them, right? The things that break the worldview. Mm -hmm. And he could see that we moved from uh, the dominant of religion, um, where, you know, you, you sort of have an epistemology of belief. And the the Enlightenment broke that because all of a sudden, you know, not all of a sudden, actually, more and more these facts like geology and whatever started, started jumping over and, and eroding. And it, he actually said that, so Kuhn thought we'd have this light, this light of scientific empiricism that would gradually and in jumps reveal more and more of a universe. That's wrong. We've just been talking about empiricism is an incomplete view of reality, right? So this is actually just what Kuhn was essentially doing was demonstrating the superiority of like modernist capitalism against the Soviet system. That's why I call it Cold War propaganda. That's what his model was for, right? Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, Ford got there and got to postmodernism before as well, everyone else, because he said things literally become true in different dominants, which would be the case with a flowing universe. So dominant of religion is overturned by the dominant of science. We are in the... And, and in the early 20th century, when science was at its complete ascendancy, when I say science, I mean the imperial materialist belief system, was at its complete ascendancy, he was calling time on it. He's like, this ends. And it ends with the damned facts that we've been talking about here, parapsychology and psi and uh, biophotons and all these things that are not allowed to be real in, in, in science as cosmology rather than pursued. So what Bear was just talking about and what Alberto um, refers to about this sort of cosmic experiment, I describe, same thing, I describe as the arrival of the dominant of wider inclusions or witchcraft. And we are now in the process, and I, I, I find it glorious. I've had a lot of grief about the things I lost last year, but I find it glorious that, and it's, it's things that used to be true are no longer true. So no one believes in the political power structure anymore, like genuinely, it's <laughs> particularly in the US. No one believes in the official pronouncements of Rockefeller medicine anymore. No one believes. So what, what we use to validate truth in the dominant of science is literally ending. Um, and sure, millions of people aren't have kind of been caught unawares and, and need to do the urgent work of um, essentially asserting sovereignty over their own epistemology and their own health and so on. That's what happens in this new dominant. But it's remarkable with the benefit of year to look back and go, finance, nope, like we don't believe a single thing, <laughs> single thing about how that sort of beams in on reality, medicine, politics, wherever you want to look, how the previous dominant was held up is melting. Um, and that's to be celebrated because it was, it's, you know, it did a lot of good things, but it's long past time. It's, and it's going to be a deeply painful transition. Well, passes the time. You know, I'm even experiencing that with things like permaculture these days and holistic healing. You know, I did the whole permaculture certification and uh, it was very painful because I came into the program with a, a long history of just growing things and, you know, living off grid and being in nature 99% of the time. And, um, you know, everything was reduced to an academic yeah. sense. And, and the, the, my classmates in the process, uh, you know, who had never had experience just living outside or, or, you know, doing all these things, you know, it, it, it was, it was, it was an intellectual endeavor and, and what I felt nothing to do with how things actually work. So uh, yeah. I had a, a young instructor who, who was always trying to correct me in things because, you know, I had to use projects on my own farm here as uh, you know, an exercise to, you know, get through the courses. Well, no, that you can't do that. And I said, well, it doesn't work that way, yeah. you know, everywhere. And I just have to do what the land tells me to do. And we, you know, and, 
and, and it's very experiential. You can't learn it in a textbook. Uh, the one thing I like uh, that Mollison did say, and, and you know, you already mentioned that quote that, you know, if you do spend some time out there in farming, you will eventually become a philosopher. Yeah. So um, he, 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 there was yeah. a strategy there which doesn't look right anymore, but I get why he did it. Right. So mm -hmm. one, um, he grew up in Stanley in Northwest Tasmania. So I'm, I'm in, I live in the Mecca of permaculture. This is where it's from. It's Tasmania's great intellectual export. Right. Um, and he had the most amazing childhood and the early part of his career was working in forestries. And so he, he lived for, you know, quarter of a year at a time on his own in the woods in, in Tasmania in the early to mid 20th century. That is wild, right? Um, most, and so, and he was a fisherman. And, and so he had this incredible life in the more than human world and then kind of had a career after the CSIRO, which is a, a federal science organization in Australia, um, got a, essentially an academic job in Hobart, which is the state capital. And so you could see strategically what he was trying to do at the time in the late seventies. It's like, this needs to be um, valid in the eyes of academia. And so you kind of have to shave the edges off to get it to fit in that shape, but it doesn't, we don't need their permission anymore. They're crap. Um, you know, if they're also going away, like this sort of bullying, this is the other thing that's failing, right? Like if you look at what um, what's happening with the great reset is one of the easiest things to automate, which they're doing is trying to get people to pay or to get a hundred thousand us dollars in debt to do a film degree over zoom. Like, that's not going to work, right? So academia as this sort of arbiter of truth itself is ending. And especially when it comes to agronomy, where they're still running on like a NPK, even when they say they're not, they're still running on like a broad acre monocrop training system. So Bill's lineage, because obviously there's the David Holmgren lineage and the Bill Mullison lineage of permaculture. Bill's lineage is seeking to be valid in the eyes of academia. And that means when it comes up against the reality of living, dare I say, in a permacultural way, Bear, um, there's a there's a disjoint there. And I, I'm reasonably close with the uh, host of Making Permaculture Stronger called Dan Palmer. It is the only permaculture podcast worth listening to because one, he's actually a designer and has been for years and knows David and, and what have you. But the whole point um, of the show is to look at whether it can be saved at what the shortcomings are. And I think it can, because again, coming the thing about Bill was that the things he would say as an aside well, where the real wisdom was, like the permaculture designer's manual, he would he he said in a grandiose way was the one book you would need to rebuild civilization. And Bill was de uh, many things, but a showman was one of them. And and that, if you realize that that's what he was thinking with it, it you probably can't. Um, but if you realize that's what he was thinking with it, it, it becomes a more a more lovely document. But he would say things as an aside. That was one of them, right? But the other thing is like honestly, when you move onto a property, just spend a year observing it. Now, from a perspectivist angle, as you observe, so are you observed. So it, I, would, I would prefer a more relational description of it. But that's true. That's not really in there in the book anywhere. But if you do that for a year and then go and do your PDC, you're more likely to have an experience like yours, Bear, although you were much more experienced with it. You know things about living in a more than human context that are at odds with the permaculture design certificate process. And that's okay, because one of the things Bill would say is that, and unfortunately it is, when he died, he, I remember in decades ago, you can probably find it on YouTube. He says, if permaculture looks the same as it does now at my death, then I will have failed. Because built into it, built into a system that is is designed on getting feedback from the more than human world on that kind of systems interactivity is the implicit telos of development and transformation. So um, permaculture can save itself if it gets out of its own way. And that's what I say to Dan, because he, a lot of people who've been in it for long enough are like, should I even use this term anymore? Uh, should I just use regenerative agriculture or, or whatever? And I think there's still medicine in the term, um, I do think, I do think it needs to chop and drop itself. Um, that's because, yeah. yeah, I think um, that's what I said to Dan because he's been working on a tree. Uh, trees are because they're a profound being. 
work really well in the imaginal and metaphorical as, as a teacher. So things that you can, the tree is kind of baked into the universe, which means it's a great learning tool in the sense that it will teach you just by its shape about things like connectivity. So Dan's been working on a tree of what permaculture might or could look like because Bill, Bill's famously on the PDC is the kind of like tree is the archetypal image of how permaculture is a, in theory a systemic philosophy. And I said, chop and drop the tree. Um, Mm-hmm. I, that, I, like, uh, into it. I like conscious agrarianism. Yeah. So you know, I, I, I don't care. Like I'm actually president of permaculture <laughs> Tasmania. So I stick with permaculture as a label. People understand it. Um, and I, and because I also, I'm a chaos magician, the same things happened to chaos magic, particularly in the nineties. Like it was, it's this really powerful and transformative framework that just got a bit shit. Um, permaculture is that it's a powerful and transformative framework and consequently and and one of the things because it's sort of anarcho designed this is the this is the bill line right bill was very um i don't you he would say he was an anarchist but like he also wasn't um but he was very much a decentralist because that's what happens when you observe ecosystems right they're decentralized a centralized ecosystem is in a state of collapse so um Hang on, where was I going with that? Why was it talking about Bill's politics? Oh, conscious agrarianism, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't care. I have to use permaculture as a, as a label, but one of the things that I think is just built, built into both chaos magic and permaculture is that if you decentralize it, if you build, if your framework relies on decentrality rather than centrality, then a lot of it at any one time is going to be shit because it's a powerful transformative framework that you make available to anyone. <laughs> and, and some people are going to run with it in, in the wrong direction. And that's, I think, part of making permaculture stronger is making peace with that, is making peace with the choir being a bit of a cacophony. Um, it, it's just part of the, the system of the framework. That's the piece I've made with both chaos magic and, uh, and permaculture. A, a decentralized system is going to be unruly. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah and we did a whole podcast on the philosophy of agrarianism and how it was been uh, kind of the benchmark for a lot of um, outgrowths of civilizations from the you know the United States of America back to the Roman times and for me it's all about a holistic interpretation of it right and the connectivity and understanding that it's all connected and so whether we call it permaculture whether we call it holistic gardening, what do we call it? You know, we have biodynamic farming, of course, from the Steiner tradition. Um, I guess these are all just terms that we all understand to be decentralized holistic systems and more just back to how nature is supposed to work. Yeah, I think so. So it's, it's a sort of conscious biomimicry one way or the other. I even struggle with agrarianism and gardening because I don't think gardens are real. Um, again, it's an English term originally French, but it's an English term that denotes a space carved out from nature, which I also don't think is real. Uh, and so if, again, coming back to indigenous systems, the Achua in uh, the Amazon don't, when they make their manioc um, beds, they don't consider their garden as separate from the jungle because they're in the jungle, they're denizens of the jungle, and so is the manioc, and so are the trees and the jaguars and so on. So the trouble with permanent agriculture, permaculture, is I'm not sure agriculture is real. <laughs> so that's what happens when you when you go with animism, is that there's no, like, when are you, how are humans separate from nature? And, and, and the wisdom of people who are in a forest context is, is the one that I, I draw on this. So in a different forest, in, in New Guinea, the people who live in the Mount Hagen area have these terms. Uh, one of them's Mbo, and the other one's Romi. And so they don't have domesticated and undomesticated. Mbo are simply species that will respond to human care and Romi are species that won't. So obviously the tubers that they grow are Mbo because they respond to human care and and humans are implicated in their life cycle. But actually other trees that are out in the forest that respond to being planted by cutting are Mbo as well because they are they are beings that are in a certain kind of relationship with the Haganas. Um, but Romi are the species that don't respond to human care. So it'll be um, plant systems that you can't propagate or there's no need to, or that they're um, sufficiently in demo point. Same thing, like pigs are in bow, but like the New Guinean Taipan is Romi because it doesn't, you, you don't build habitat 
for a snake. I mean, you'll end up getting a snake in your chicken pens or whatever, but you don't build it. And so I don't know how you fold that into something like permaculture, except it, which is something Dan is very interested in is uh, permaculture is essentially therapy. Like if you're doing it professionally, what you're doing is surfacing, <laughs> what you're doing is surfacing what a, what a couple or a young family or a person moving on to land you have to help them find what their best life looks like because they know it sort of has something to do with, well, I want to live more consciously, more authentically. Um, I want to be more involved in my own food systems, but people just kind of go, give me a permaculture design, put my swales up and, and whatever. And like, but do you want to be a farmer? Do you actually want to be an orchardist? And most of them don't, particularly in Australia, we call them tree changes. I don't know what you call them there but it's sort of boomers and, and early Gen X now who've made their money in the cities and, you know, moved to a semi-rural or rural property and they get in a permaculture designer, like permaculture this. It's like, well, hang on, stop. Because you're approaching a retirement age in your life. Do you want to move into manual work at this stage? So permaculture should be from a people care perspective about surfacing that and things like Mbo and Romy, are ideas or, or, or frameworks that maybe work better there because it's like, well, what do you like about permaculture? It's like, oh, I want more habitat for native systems. Great, I can do that. Do you know what I mean? And, and we don't have the language Dan says, and it's true, permaculture is a, um, a design science without a theory of design. Um, and it's also a misdiagnosed couples therapy very often. Um, and and I, I, like all, <laughs> I like all those tensions. I like them. I think, I think that's um, Bayo Komalafe is a Nigerian philosopher whom I love and he's been on the show, has this notion of making sanctuary, which is what we do. It's these small, humble moves in the face of daunting challenges. And permaculture is very much in that. And, and where you make sanctuary is in the cracks. Um, it's in a pain point. So, so you can do decolonial sanctuary work and, and whatever, right? And, and permaculture itself is sanctuary making in a crack because it's um, a response to the fact that humans are not living in right relation, to put it mildly, um, with the more than human world is, is one thing. But also permaculture itself has cracks. Like it has, it's a couples therapy and it doesn't know it. It's a design science without a theory of design. There's a bunch of stuff. There's a bunch of exciting pain points there, which is why I kind of remain interested intellectually in the movement, however much. Magic disappoints me too. Like the, the, my two great intellectual loves have simultaneously have disappointed me just as much as they've inspired me. And I don't see that ever changing. And I kind of hope it doesn't. Mm. Yeah. yeah. This is a great conversation because it's something I've wrestled with for a long time. You know, we're out here and we grow medicinal herbs and we try to do it as congruous with our surroundings because we are surrounded by wilderness and, um, you know, just try to let it flow one to the other. But as we walk through the forest around us, we have everything we need already growing. We can identify these things as great food, great medicine. So there's really no point in what we're doing in the first place, except for the fact that other people that don't have or haven't made the opportunity to do what we do, you know, now what we grow, we can make it available to them so that they can live yeah. their urban lifestyle and still have the benefit of herbs. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm always, um, just wondering if what we're doing is just a, a stepping stone to where everybody uh, goes back to that kind of connection to the land. Is that even possible anymore? Um, it's, well, uh, and, it's a curious situation. And I'd like to interject too the idea of, the, and this is a Western mindset, but of, of the Western consciousness, our, our, our ability to be designers and that our reality in effect is always evolving and we are developing new sensibility of reality that should be in conjunction with nature, but yeah. the Western mind believes in evolution towards greater things, right? Yeah. And that's why um, we've seen a massive outburst in the last three centuries of all this amazing, you know, development. Of course, many of it has been disastrous for the planet, but we, if with the right holistic mindset, that's why what Bear was kind of hinting to earlier, which we've talked about a bunch, is taking the Aboriginal, the Indigenous mindset of tribe and this holistic connection, and then applying that within the framework of a more, I, I hate to say the term progressive because it has so much, you know, other feeling to it, but this progressive notion of evolution towards the stars, for instance, or towards building better systems so that we can, and this actually kind of works into the Steiner idea too, which I wanted to bring up, which is, has our consciousness 
evolved over the eons to where we're, and maybe it's not an evolve, maybe it's an up and down wave kind of thing. But as we change as a species versus the more traditional mindset of, a, uh, of an indigenous culture, which is more, I guess, static and within perfect kind of homeostasis. No, I'm, I'm not sure if it is. That's the thing. So okay. to, to, to try to port indigenous um, frameworks and in your implicit in that is that you think science describes it better and you think that importing indigenous stuff it's that's the colonial extraction process i don't think that works and not just that we're about to learn that one way or the other we're about to learn that um history is not a grand march into an ever improving future that's the dumbest and most dangerous fucking idea um, that well, I couldn't agree more with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so well, you mentioned Catherine Fritz, uh, whom I love um, and I consider a mentor and I've, we've been out in the desert and whatever. Um, she paraphrases Tina Turner very often. Um, we can either do this nice or rough and, um, and it's perfect. And it's sort of what we're talking about. Even thinking like back to the land or like will humans get back into touch with nature is still old thinking for it because we, we can do this nice or rough. We're about to learn that, the, that um, dare I say, vitalism is a kind of true thing one way or the other. We're about to learn it by leaning into it in advance of the kind of clampdowns on food supply and, and, and genetically modified pea protein in replacement for meat and all the other kind of, which will fail, but disastrous projects that if you aren't moving in your own direction, you're going to have subjected to. And so we're going to get both. We're going to get a realization that this is such a strange way of saying it, but the West is so fucked, like that the living world is actually alive. That's one. Um, and two, I don't like sort of back to nature or back to the land is because it's, again, it's, it's a Western framework, but whatever that is, again, we're going to find it. We're going to find that yeah. there is such a thing as aliveness in the living world and the collapse. Like, so we're also going to learn that it isn't a grand march into the future because um, we are, we are in a, in the next decade is a transitional process of um, the economic capital, certainly moving from um, the Americas to Northeast Asia again. And it isn't again, like it goes in cycles, right? Everything goes in cycles. Well, I, and to so, clarify, Gordon, I guess I wasn't talking about more of the physicality of science. I was talking more about the Western mysticism ideas of like ascension and evolution in those terms. As yeah, a singular so, experience of consciousness versus the more kind of tribal collective kind of, um, you know, uh, communal aspect and communion with nature. You yeah, know, I agree. Okay, you know, fair you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Yeah. Eastern so that, first I, Western mysticism. We, essentially. This is the, the, the long shadow of Neoplatonism, right? That's what I was referring to earlier, that mm -hmm. we think spirituality is up. Um, spirituality is relational. Um, you, you, that, and, and you can find that I think we sort of describe it wrong to ourselves mystically when we think of it as up. And even I'm talking about the, the Kabbalists and, and grimoirists and people who actually did it because there are some remarkable documents and I have friends who've performed them. I've never done, been that interested in the vertical ones. Um, I have friends who've performed them and it's been life-changing. Um, and, but I, my mystical experiences have all been horizontal. It's been, I, 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 but you end up in the same place. You end up with the, um, the fundamental in your bones experience and understanding that you are in relation to a living cosmos. Um, and I don't really care if people think they're going up to get it, but I agree completely. The framework is not um, up to code for where we're going. Um, it did its thing. So I don't know if you know who um, Orlin Bishop is, but he's a, an amazing um intellectual and he's done yeah, it does stuff with charles eisenstein right yeah and in his most recent one because i am a huge fan of charles um so are we uh, we had charles he, on the show last year it was fantastic yeah, it's, it's incredible um and all was saying in the last conversations with him on charles's website if people are interested kind of going back to that master and his emissary idea of like what were the last three centuries of this um project built out of a failed theory of mind that nevertheless transformed the world and, and gave us space travel or whatever is. And he said, because in the master and his emissary model, in the McGilchrist model, which I don't like, um, because I don't like the left brain, right brain stuff, is, was the, um, that, that sort of logos mind, if you will, has, has gone on this disastrous journey and it'll eventually come back to being the support role for more of the imaginal or, you know, mine. And we kind of know what that is, but 
Um, because I asked Gary Lackman, who's very interested in, in McGilchrist's ideas, what do you think is going on there? Because I, I don't think it's a good trade because we killed millions of people and, and almost destroyed, like the, the biodiversity loss and, and everything that's, that's happened with it. I'm like, I just don't think it was a very good trade. And, and Orland nailed it for me because he was essentially asked the same question. And he said the last three centuries were an initiation. And, and more importantly, he kind of doubled down on that and said, we're not done being initiated by knowledge yet. And we're not ready to be initiated by wisdom. So the last three centuries, disastrous as they are, is a sort of initiation by knowledge. So empiricism and, and the enlightenment and all these things. that have, and, and because we haven't got it right, because we haven't actually kind of put knowledge in, in the correct scale versus something like wisdom, we've caused dramatic um, pain and, and initiation, and initiation is painful. And that's the right frame for me um, is the last three centuries of, of everything is, is an initiation by knowledge. And we are approaching the end, hopefully, of being initiated by knowledge and, and realizing what it is and what it isn't. And then we can be initiated by wisdom. And I think that's really useful. It's another frame of, looking at where we are in the context of, of where we've been and, and very likely where we're going, right? So we're in the process of being initiated by knowledge. And that's how I sit with the pain of it, right? Because these, um, look at how we're communicating now. This is the famous example. People mistake technology for science and say, oh, but science gave us Zoom and these cameras. No, it didn't. Um, technology did, and technology predates the scientific project. It was begun. The Industrial Revolution was begun by Anglicans, like churchgoers. It was not. Anyway, it doesn't matter. That's a separate rant. Um, more importantly, is <laughs> you're like, going to get you're going to get me down that Tartaria <laughs> model before I know it. Like the organs. But of like, the more, more importantly, <laughs> is um, it's really dangerous in a master and his emissary model to try and do it as a trade off. It's like. Um, at the time of Spanish contact, there were between 10 and 20 million people living east of the Andes. It was probably about 15 in Peru. Um, decades later, there's 200,000 Peruvians and a couple hundred thousand as far as we can tell in the, in the Amazon. That is 25 to 30 million people. Crazy. And it's one example. So you look at it and go, hmm, I'm, I like my camera, but do I like it 25 million dead people? And so the master and his emissary model isn't good because it's sort of giving you a pro con for the imperial project, um, which I reject that way of thinking about it. And what Orlin gave me was a, a more medicinal way of thinking about it, which is the whole planet is being initiated by knowledge and where we continue to fuck it up. So we're not done with the initiation. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the right way of, I think, holding the tension of the tremendous damage we have done and are continuing to do, as well as the opportunities that come with with the end of an initiation so you that's say, how that's how i approach the apocalypse you could also say it's empowering because it takes away the victimhood of the master you know illuminati yeah. or whoever who's in charge and that you know oh well well you know they're the you know we're up against this great force and you know whereas opposed no they're part of the whole system too correct that's exactly yeah. it's and it also takes and guilt isn't quite the right word um although it it is healthy to be with guilt if you do it just temporarily you don't don't dwell in it like a filthy bath right um but it's how do i to call it an initiation we're all going through allows you to sit with your complicity in in the good and the bad of it without it falling into um useless identitarian um frameworks of it which don't help not that people aren't um, unevenly harmed by the process we've gone on over the last three centuries, perish the thought, but that how do we sit with that pain? How do I, how do I sit with the fact that I've been harmed by it, but have benefited of more than other people? And if, and, and the initiation is the right framework for it, right? Because it puts us all in together and allows it to be different and allows not even blame, but it allows it to be a process. And it, again, it, it frees you from, which is generally, it's my political mode anyway, um, is to be not necessarily in opposition, but avoidance of the predator class's plans. Um, so that, that's, yeah, definitely separate, but avoiding the predator, the predator class acting in its own class interest is, uh, is good politics for me. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, and just just not participating and giving it your energy. I think uh, absolutely. You know, a lot of what yeah, what I see a lot of is people that are trying to return to the agrarian lifestyle or whatever you want to call it. It becomes more of um, what would you like uh, like an archaic revival of sorts, yeah. you know, where everybody's, you know, rather than, you know, I, I like the way you, you suggest that, you know, we're in a, a period of knowledge, you know, we're, we, we call it the information age, but I believe knowledge is actually when you put information to an experience, you have an experience that becomes knowledge. And then hopefully that knowledge becomes wisdom someday, you know, and some of our um, practices, you know, in radio CG, we actually, differentiate when we tune in and the ways we do to those different spiritual levels or, you know, again, we're playing a word game, but yeah. they are distinct energetic stratums. And uh, when we get up into those areas of what we would call wisdom, which is, you know, we would consider a, another refined level of energy that we're part of, but maybe not experiencing yet. Uh, but then we can kind of work with it by aligning the things we do in our healthcare and, and whatnot so that we can perceive if what we're doing is actually benefiting all those layers or just keeping somebody exclusively on one level that's uh, keeping them in the same old box. You know, Mike and I had a discussion earlier today when we we're talking and um, you were likening this to medicine. You know, lately I've had to do a lot of interviews about biotrain medicine because that mm -hmm. was my specialty for many years. And so everybody's now is having the big debate, you know, about germ theory versus biotrain. Yeah. So it's, it's in a way kind of painful to me to have to go on there and be the bioterrain guy yeah, yeah, yeah. because uh, as I was telling Michael, it's just another false dichotomy, germ theory yes. versus bioterrain. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, oh. so, um, Couldn't agree more. Couldn't so agree here more. I am, you know, I've become sort of the, the poster doctor for bioterrain medicine, but I don't believe in the whole shebang, yeah. <laughs> you know, if, if I'm Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they both it. come out of the same, what Charles would call the world story, right? So when this yeah. whole op happened, I had to do the same thing when I'm trying to get, um, so again, this is another thing I got from Catherine, like to focus on win-win engagements rather than win-lose engagements. So as this all happened, I, not to your extent, Bear, obviously, but I made, I'd come to my own understanding of the limitations of how we describe health and, and things that we currently call viruses and whatever, long before all this happened. Particularly when it came to viruses, I got that from, you know, ancient aliens and directed panspermia when I was doing Starship. So long and, and preventative medicine and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then the op lands and it's like, shit, how do you catch people up on that 20 years of work, especially when they're in a state of fear, right? So I had to kind of, I started off with bubbling, very phenomenological. I'm like, bubble what you think of viruses and how we um, understand whether it's present in you here. And then we'll move to things you can do from an immune system that remember, you know, are true about fear and its impact and, and even ignore what an immune system is. And I had to bubble it along because I know it's the same thing and, and it's not, ah, it's part of that initiatory process that people have to realize that um, not just the germ theory we're being fed is wrong, but that germ theory versus terrain theory is in a world story that is wrong. And, and, and it's, you can get um, better health sovereignty out of, uh, out of a terrain understanding. So there's a sort of urgency in, in having that discussion, but I share your frustration <laughs> because when it, when it all happened, I'm like, right. So we have to do a lot of things. I have to catch you up on a lot of stuff while you're in a state of fear, which is when you are, and every, again, it's another thing we can demonstrate. People who are afraid are cognitively impaired. It's why, you know, um, mind control stuff has worked so well over the last 70 years. Um, so it's like, right, okay. Yeah, I, I, I share that. I share that with you. I share the... Um, and they're also mostly coming from the wrong epistemological or ontological yeah. perspective to begin yeah. with. So, so <laughs> yeah. you know, it's so like... Much, much to get through, much to get through, not a lot of time. And that's when Catherine was talking about win-win engagements rather than win-lose. I'm like, cool, okay. A win-lose engagement is arguing over whether this came out of a fucking lab in, in Wuhan or uh, um, what a case is or any of that kind of crap is win-lose. Um, and there will be a time for it. 
Uh, and you can, in the same way that, because what I told people, and this worked, was we still haven't reached consensus on what happened to JFK, right? 70 years, still going as a hobby. You think we won't be talking about this in 70 years? So let's just leave that in the win-lose column for now and talk about the win-win things. So let's talk about um, dietary health. Let's talk about um, energetic health. Let's talk about not staying in a state of fear. Let's talk about physical movement. Let's talk about things you can do um, that let's focus on the things you can do. Let's focus on your actual sovereignty and, and, and so on. And that's how I managed my way through the last 11 months. But I, I'm really glad you said that about the, I experienced a little frustration being the bioterrain guy because whilst there is value in medicine in the discussion for others, it's weird to have a discussion about something that you don't think is true. Like that is a imperfect which is always going to be, but like uh, there are better ways of having the discussion, but you kind of have to have that discussion first to get people through. It's been, it's been an amazing final well, few yeah, years yeah, of yeah. the initiation of knowledge. <laughs> it, it, I was just going to say real quick, Mike, sorry. Um, oh, we also invert when we're talking about good solution based, uh, you know, positive direction kind of sort of things like you mentioned diet. People are always, okay, what's the best diet and everything? And food is what we are. And it's like, I say, no, 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 no. Food is not who you are. And it's not what you eat. But food can be, uh, you know, very revelatory. If you look at it as a reflection of your consciousness is the things you choose in your lifestyle. So again, we invert it. We say, well, that lifestyle, that food is going to do this. And that's what I need to do. As, as opposed to just looking at your experience and understanding why you're doing what you're doing. So uh, everything's pretty much upside down at this point. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, it is. Uh, well that's why I was just going to say another strategy too is, and something we talk about with the, at the summit here and uh, it, that's coming up and what our mission is, is you know, find your tribe, find, and maybe tribe isn't the right word, find your community, find those who are on the level with you right now that you can share and grow with and not have to expend all this energy explaining, you know, the nature of a virus or, you know, what holistic health means or what disease actually is. I mean, I know that's difficult because like I have family members that aren't on that level and I spend time with them because they're my parents or what you know yeah I'm getting i'm getting my dad on that level though good um but but you know it does make it easier right to have that like whether it's a virtual tribe or community or whatnot of people like Al our alpha Veda community that's why our telegram people love our telegram because you can go there and not have to explain all the backstory of why you're talking about something because everyone already has that foundational knowledge that yeah. what we're talking about that knowledge so that is something that is good to be doing right now is reaching out, going out well, in your comfort zone. It, it's, it's happening regardless, right? So one of the best podcasts I heard last year, and I've shared it a bunch of times on the blog, was an Aubrey Marcus episode in November with Dr. Zach mm -hmm. Bush, whom I adore. Um, and Zach said, the people who need to find each other to be and build what comes next are in the process of finding each other right now. Because he says, if there was, um, if there was a, a, an op to control the planet by fear and misinformation this year, referring to 2020, it fundamentally failed. Because what it's done has essentially activated the people to do that. And, and I know what you mean about tribe and so on. I will, I will revert back to an animist and perspectivist um, model. And I used to talk about this when I had proper jobs in London. And Snapchat showed up. Because I've given talks at Google and all over Europe and whatever about publisher strategy and, and digital strategy and so on. And, and Snapchat appeared and took off with the kids at the time. And I'm like, what is this about? And it's actually about a return of the authentic because if you've grown up with the internet and I have, the goal from the nineties on was to kind of get into the internet and live in this glorious digital utopia. This, that, that trajectory has been there through MySpace all the way up to Facebook. It's um, things are better online. Like that's the utopia. Snapchat showed up because if you grew up with that, like if you were a child when Facebook, if you don't have a memory of a time before Facebook, Snapchat makes sense to you, right? Um, because it's actually, if you weren't there for that moment, if you don't already know me, if you weren't there for a thing that happened in real life, it's not for you. 
So that was the beginning of the return of the authentic because the older internet is one of scale. It's like, let's tip everyone into the one website, Facebook, whatever. Um, the, the tribe finding you're referring to isn't one big tribe. It is, it is an Amazonian model. <laughs> it is millions of smaller tribes, authentic connections in relation with each other. So I've only just started it, but there's, I mean, I have a, a very large um, member section of the website and so on. So RuneSoup has a tribe, but we've got a Telegram group and I'm in groups for my energy medicine training and, and, and different podcasts and so on. And there's overlap between them. And that's a decentralized, robust model. It's, it's, it's tribes in relation. And, and rather than like one big tribe. And I think, although maybe he would have articulated differently, that's what Zach was referring to, because that's not just what's happening now. That's the only thing that can survive what it has to go through, what, we're, what we have to go through, which especially for the next couple of years is sort of laying the tracks in front of the train as we go, getting away from censorship and deplatforming and, and so on. Because I, I started a Telegram group, not because I think, I'm quietly confident, although who knows, it'll last longer than Facebook or Twitter or they'll probably last, but are already too awful to use. One day, Telegram will get the parlor treatment, right? We know that. So it's more about building on an analog level your tribe that it can be digitally fulfilled because the platforms are going to keep getting the squash treatment as the technocratic takeover um, rolls along to its apogee and then quick failure, right? I'm really excited by that model. The only one that's going to survive is, is a decentralized um, communion of tribes, I think. I agree. You're speaking to my heart. This is what I do. I don't know if you know my background, but I do decentralized blockchain projects. We've got Cordal, go. Cordal off the ground, which is we were featured on with Sayer G recently got us kind of into the broader spectrum. We've been an underground project six years in the making of cypherpunks working on this. And it's that's the plan. Decentralized hosting. Dis, we have a decentralized telegram chat function already built into the current UI that actually um, allows for people to create their own groups and it's fully encrypted, decentralized. Uh, uh, it's starting to get the notice of people. And uh, I believe that is the future where we all own a, a bit, a piece of, of the pie. And um, we take responsibility and sovereignty for that. That's why I love like something like Bitcoin, right? And, um, and then basically you have a ledger, you have what I call like what the Egyptians pyramids were, which was their blockchain is essentially... <laughs> Right. Yeah. Um, is yeah. we have that connectivity because it's good to have the tribes. It's good to have the islands of of little microcosms of of like minded people. But we need to have that connectivity too, so that yeah. you know. And so that's what a, like a truly decentralized public blockchain with the right consensus and all that good stuff does. Unlike I don't know if you're familiar with like the Fediverse model, which is like Mastodon and these like yes, you know. And the problem with that is if enough people just stop running the server, it's gone. It's like into the ether gone so having an immutable ledger of truth is to me one of the most amazing innovations of the 21st century it is the the innovation i think it's going to be one of the bedrocks to the new kind of landmark society we're all going to be entering in this new aquarian age and so that being said you're spot on sir gordon i um please and tell us your telegram group so is it an open group that people can oh yeah join yeah, yeah. it's it's um i it, it think it's rune soup i think it's t.me rune soup or rune soup chat um it, we've got like a channel and a, a group um and so you'll find one from the other <laughs> that's fantastic yeah, i haven't actually kind of announced it or anything yet but um we, we'll keep it going again because i think because I, uh, I'm generally bullish uh, and also suspicious, as you can, you've had Allison on as well, and also suspicious of some of the capacities of of certain crypto tech as it's being rolled out. Because it's clearly a cornerstone of what they want. There's some stuff that I, I remain bullish about. Whatever happens, Bitcoin, one of them. Um, and so, yes, I'm. I like. I think you're right. I think uh, blockchain is is one of the will be one of the cornerstone innovations of this Aquarian moment or the um, the triplicity of air to use longer as astrological cycles, unless we get two years without a grid, <laughs> right? So it's sort of like making sure there's digital behaviors that mimic genuine relational connection. Speaking of permaculture again, 
one of Dan's episodes last year that I was listening to, because I was in London when this whole project started about a year ago in March, right? Like, okay, I guess I have to flee Europe. Weird karma I should go and look into one day, given that I'm part Jewish, but raced back one of the last planes because I'm still not allowed to leave Australia. And so then I'm stuck not being able to go anywhere. I mean, like literally on the farm or whatever, because I had to have two weeks. I've, I've spent a month not allowed to leave my house so far because um, I keep leaving the state. Anyway, um, listening to this podcast, walking around with Dan, and one of my frustrations with permaculture is that scientific thing is it, a Bill would have, ha would have had a problem with this. I, I wish Bill were alive for the pandemic because he was, um, he wouldn't take shit from state power. And, and I don't see enough voices that are like mm. that in permaculture. And they're like taking it very seriously. And I have my AGM yep. in, the, in the Northwest and it's like, you know, <laughs> distancing <laughs> and all this. You're so speaking to us right now, by the way. Couldn't, <laughs> couldn't cope. Like we're, we're permaculture. Like we, we're eating correctly and getting vitamin D if you want to talk about it in those languages. And it doesn't matter. But one of this guy, and it was, a, Dan had a guy on talking about the pandemic as if it was real and whatever. But he said, be a guild in place. They're talking about how to be a guild in place. I'm like, that's right. So I've the last year I've been saying be a guild in place and be a rhizome in the world. And, mm -hmm. and that is the sort of, again, like trees because they are real beings uh, are sort of fractally, um, are fractal teachers. Because if you think about a tree for long enough, you literally get enlightened like Buddha. Like it's the plants are here to teach us in, in, in an animist sense. And similarly, when you're talking about guilds, famously the three mothers, but we know what guilds are, right? Um, or three sisters, depending on where you are in, in the US. Um, uh, and, and, and the rhizome, same thing. So you, you living systems or living beings are, appear to be, and this says something very profound about theory of mind. If you think with living beings, you have healthier and better thoughts. And so be a guild in place and be a rhizome in the world is sort of how I'm seeing. And I'm letting digital systems fulfill that analog function because we don't know how we, well, we can say with a high degree of confidence that they're not trustworthy, but they're not trustworthy to the point of there are some scenarios where there is no internet for nine months. Like there's nothing, right? Um, I don't think that's a highly likely one um, given they want 5G to run their fucking digital currency and whatever, but I don't think that's a highly likely one, but it's, it, it's you still have to begin, situate your thinking in, in an analog level and have the digital fulfill it. And, and I like, uh, I like the promise of blockchain on on that level, right? Which is, yes. do you know, um, you need to live a blockchain life, even if the grid is down. Does that make sense? You need to have an attitude that likes blockchain if you're going to live authentically with or without, I think is what I'm trying well, to say. It, Rather it, than it, like it, the future is blockchain, because you know, if you're in that world, yeah. you know that there are people who are, and God bless them, too bullish, too utopian about the definite great promise of it. And, and we are looking at the next few years where there are some scenarios that include like no grid for a tremendous amount of the West. So it's like, well, well, you know. this gets deep. This also gets well. A couple of things, real quick. And I know Bear is loving this because we are actually all about analog technology. And one thing I stress is that this is just this is like the stone or the 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 flint and steel or the the wheel till we get to the true analog technology, which will go back to crystals and go back to yeah, uh, you know, eventually us being psychic, and that'll be the this the internet is basically the beginning of us being psychic again. Now but, you're talking my language. Yes. <laughs> and so getting into true analog technology, digital is just kind of the simulacrum crossover into that. But but that being said, we're still working on mesh networking. We're working on countermeasures to that. So at least there's connectivity within. Um, so, for instance, with our with the Cordal, you can what we call Mint, which is a low power version of mining. It's not proof of work. We have our own consensus mechanism. Um, mm -hmm. And it's called minting, but you can run it with a Raspberry Pi on a solar panel. So we're we're coming up with solutions with that understanding because we the people who are behind us are like us, Gordon. We're not the the tech bros out of Silicon Valley, which is ninety five percent of crypto. By the way, now it's Wall Street two point oh. Yeah. Um, uh, it's we all are open source, right, Michael? 
everything's open source. You, if you want to be a developer, come on in. Unfortunately, right now we're on <laughs> Discord, but eventually we'll be on our own platform, which will be our own Slack and everything on there, decentralized. Come on in. Like, we'll, yeah, we have our core guys. We'll kind of vet you and stuff, but then you can come in. You go through a process, a rite of passage to get in. And then once you're in, then you can start getting involved with committing code. Of course, there's got to be a 60% evaluation understanding by the developers to agree to that. But then that's the beauty of open source and nature is open source. Nature is decentralized. So that's where we need to go. And that's why you get it, Gordon. So exciting to have you on. We are kind of running up on time, man. I could talk to you all damn day though. I tell <laughs> yeah, you. Gordon, we'll give you the uh, the last word here. And, and it's been a delightful talk. And, uh, you know, my only last comment, I think with all this technology is, again, we're kind of going about it backwards is that uh, I believe the purpose of it is to start understanding that everything we're experiencing technologically is a fractal of what has always existed. Yep. And uh, you know, rather than looking at something that is going to uh, overcome us or bail us out or, you know, wh whatever you think of it. But uh, thanks so much for being here. So any, any great last words for us? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think that's good. And having sort of wailed on the Greeks for Neoplatonism, um, mm -hmm. they were again going earlier in, into Greek history. They, techne is a very good idea. So they, 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 they were thinking with different, theories of mind. So the, the techne being a different way of thinking and, and, and thinking with other stuff. I, I think, um, I agree. I think technology is, is, uh, is a human song that we sing and it's, it, it's trying to like relearn a memory. It's trying to like relearn a song from our childhood. Right. So we're, we're sort of doing that. And, and one of the most like truly idiotic belief systems that I can't believe that you can be this rich and, have this many degrees and and be sort of a technocrat or a transhumanist. I'm like, you've you can't even understand technology, let alone reality, if if you think that this is where we're going, right? Because it's it's not, it's um it's a song we do. Uh, and 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 that's how it should be. And and we'll get there, I presume. Um and I I sort of have this when I think with technology and, and how I want it, it's like, well, how do I actually want to live? What are the things that I want? Do I want a high technology life? And I don't know if um, high speed video calls counts, probably does, uh, but the, our priorities once we moved here were um, making sure, and it's all technology. Like um, when people talk about low energy, it's free energy. And this is a, another kind of thing I um, hammer on for permaculture, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, we, I don't need it down here because I'm in a cool temperate climate, but the sort of underwater, um, sort of air conditioning pipes that you dig a meter down and 20 meters along mm -hmm. and you can pull um, cool air into your house, right? And, and it's used in the desert and it's in the permaculture designers manual. That's considered a low energy solution, but it's free energy. It's free, it doesn't turn off. It's, it's, it, you're actually, when you're in relation and in harmony with how the universe works, it, it doesn't matter and technology can get us there. So that's digging a hole. And, and putting a pipe in is technology, but it's it, that's a free energy technology. So we've been looking at that. It's rainwater harvesting and, and, and so on. So at a baseline level, um, and it's the same problem I have with preppers is that you, you're living in the wrong world story, even if I like what you're doing. <laughs> um, not the stockpiling guns in a bunker, but the um, sovereignty of, of energy and, and whatever. If you could actually do that without being in a place of fear, if you could do that because you wish to live authentically, um, it, it's marvelous. And, and, and technology is part of that. It's one of the songs we sing. So it's been a great chat. Oh man, Gordon, <laughs> thank you so much, man, for joining us today. Uh, really appreciate that. We've had a nice little lively chat going on and people are, um, have just been nothing but positive, no trolls or anything popping in. So, uh, <laughs> that's cool. You Better must have put a little... Time magical spell around the uh the show today yeah. um but hey thanks again and um we'll put your website and everything in the show notes uh just for the those listening could you please uh tell us the best website for people to find you at yeah sure runesoup.com it's all there except currently the telegram group i'll probably update it over the weekend um but yeah runesoup.com you'll find everything you'll find the books you'll find the show you'll find the membership all that kind of stuff Wonderful. Hey, uh, thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, you can, uh, you know, if you like this chat, please share it with your friends. 
put it push it on down the line um give it a like subscribe you know do all that stuff on wherever you're watching this and um as bear said we will be at anarcha poco in two weeks now i think that starts march 8th uh bear will be talking on the health and wellness stage uh and uh andy kaufman's featured that day and a number of our friends uh, are involved it's going to be a really fun time. Unfortunately, we won't be in Alcapoco. We'll we'll be there next year, um, just because we have reunion summit in two weeks and just the farm and everything. We've we're just deep in it. But um, yeah, you can actually go uh, look at the show notes beneath, below, or go to our Telegram or our website, um, and also join our mailing list. And we have a discount. So if you want to, so Anarcapoco is doing a digital thing this year because of all the stuff going on. So you can join the virtual uh, event and you can get a discount by uh, using our affiliate link. Uh, and I'll put that in the show notes below. And then um, last Gordon, do you have anything coming up you wanted to uh, pitch or promote or? Oh yeah. That? So I'm, I'm actually launching a new show for people who are interested in magic. It's called Fortune's Fools. And it starts on the 18th of March at the weekly show where we go through the Lenormand tarot deck with a friend of mine who's an artist week by week. There's 36 of them. And, we will crowd design our own um, Lenormand um, Oracle card deck uh, and, wow. and have discussions about the different Ooh. aspects of that. That's on my YouTube. Um, so again, you'll find the details at runesoup.com. So I do have something coming up. I will, <laughs> I will be there for that one. Nice. Nice. Awesome. Yes. I, I, I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, well, hey, thank you guys so much for listening and watching or wherever you are. We love you. Remember, as we always end the show, remember to get outside, get your feet dirty in the dirt, get your hands dirt, grow something, go for a hike. Mother Nature is the best teacher and healer. We love you. Thank you. And we'll see you next uh, week for another amazing show. And um, remember, reunionsummit.com. Go register there. Um, that is five months in the making going to be well worth your time uh there and bear will be featured he's got his own uh hour and some 15 minute talk on a, a really cool and then he's also on a panel with the biggleson brothers and andrew kaufman um and that's a was an that's an amazing panel you're not going to want to miss so okay guys love you we'll talk to you later see ya hey everybody in d live world hey thanks so much lively chat see you in telegram or on discord love